पार्ट थ्री पेरी ऑपरेटिव केयर चैप्टर नंबर सेवेंटीन प्री ऑपरेटिव केयर इंक्लूडिंग दी हायर एस्ट सर्जिकल पेशेंट इंट्रोडक्शन द स्ट्रेस ऑफ मेजर सर्जरी कैन लीड टू इंक्रीज ऑक्सीजन डिमांड बाय अबाउट फोर्टी परसेंट चेंजेस सच एज साइटोकाइन रिलीज रिलेटेड इन्फ्लेमेटरी चेंजेस एंडोक्राइन रिस्पॉन्स हाइपर क्वाइगलेबिलिटी एंड रीडिस्ट्रीब्यूशन ऑफ फ्लूड बिटवीन कंपार्टमेंट्स में लास्ट सेवरल पोस्ट ऑपरेटिव डेज The purpose of careful pre-operative planning is to minimize the unwanted effects of these physiological changes. Systematic history taking, examination and ordering of investigations at the pre-operative clinic should include not only an assessment of functional reserve but also the formulation of advice on optimization to best cope with the anticipated operative stress. General practitioner records and hospital notes are useful sources of baseline information. GPS can help by monitoring chronic conditions adjusting medications and facilitating in weight reduction exercise and cessation of smoking a simple questionnaire working within agreed guidelines can identify high risk patients undergoing high risk surgery needing specific tests and optimization patients with severe comorbidities or undergoing high risk surgery should be referred to specialists to quantify and to reduce perioperative risks risks of surgery anesthesia and the effects of comorbid conditions should be discussed so that the patient can make an informed decision patients should be advised on nil by mouth and regular medication and pre medication at the pre operative visit a plan for the operating list should be drawn up and all those involved in making the list run smoothly should be informed the who checklist which is started just prior to induction of anesthesia and continued during and after the surgery aims to approve the safety of anesthesia and surgery summary 17.1 pre operative plan for the best patient outcomes gather and record all relevant information optimize patient condition choose surgery that offers minimal risk and maximum benefit anticipate and plan for adverse events adequate hydration nutrition and exercise are advised patient assessment evidence suggests that correction of anemia better diabetes control pre operative exercises and better nutrition leads to better patient outcomes and fewer post operative complications based on population statistics associated comorbidities and the type of surgery one can estimate risks for an individual undergoing surgery and various tools and scores can be used as risk predictors history taking each organ system should pro, pro Each or each organ system problem should be noted with dates, etiology, and treatment delivered. Screening questions will reveal fitness for surgery and anesthesia. Patients with recent chest infection should be assessed for an anesthetic risks and post-operative surgical infection. Increasing severity of symptoms generally indicates worsening of the condition and possible need for a cha- change in medication. Inability to achieve four metabolic equivalents, example. climbing of flight of stairs increases cardiac risk after major surgery some factors leading to these findings may be amenable to treatment pre operatively such as anemia angina palpitations or obesity the history of past surgery and anesthesia can reveal the problems one may face during current hospitalization example intra abdominal adhesions for planned laparoscopic surgery succinctonium apnea The use of recreational drugs and alcohol consumption should be noted as they are known to be associated with adverse outcomes. Check for allergies and risk factors for deep vein thrombosis. Social history, ability to communicate and mobility are important in planning rehabilitation after surgery. So summary 17.2 principles of history taking. Listen, what is the problem? Ask open questions. Clarify, what does the patient expect? Closed questions. narrow differential diagnosis focused questions fitness comorbidities fixed questions key topics in past medical history table 17.1 cardiovascular ischemic heart disease angina myocardial infarction hypertension heart failure dysrhythmia peripheral vascular disease deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism respiratory chronic obstructive pulmonary disease asthma respiratory infections gastrointestinal peptic ulcer disease and gastroesophageal reflux liver disease genital urinary tract urinary tract infection renal dysfunction neurological epilepsy cerebrovascular accidents and transient ischemic attacks psychiatric disorders cognitive function endocrine or metabolic diabetes thyroid dysfunction pheochromocytoma porphyria locomotor system osteoarthritis inflammatory arthropathy such as rheumatoid arthritis other hiv virus hiv hepatitis tuberculosis malignancy allergy previous surgery problems encountered 
family history of problems with anesthesia examination patient should be treated with respect and dignity receive a clear explanation of the examination undertaken and be kept as comfortable as possible a chaperon should be present especially for intimate examinations this will often be part of a local guide or policy in symptomatic patients one should look specifically for evidence of cardiac failure raised jvp fine pulmonary crackles gallop rhythm peripheral vascular disease loss of peripheral pulses ulcerations and valvular heart disease with characteristic murmurs example ejection systolic murmur in aortic stenosis pan systolic murmur in tricuspid regurgitation and mid systolic mid diastolic murmur in mitral stenosis heard at respective areas on auscultation when possible the medical or surgical treatments for these conditions should be started and the patient stabilized before elective surgery united kingdom statistics show that patients with cardiac failure or cirrhosis even though on treatment have a high 8% 30 day mortality after surgery the presence of a rapid respiratory rate reduced air entry crepitations and wrong time indicate respiratory problems a history of dyspnea with along with examination findings of tachycardia raised jvp tricuspid regurgitation hepatomegaly and edematous feet will indicate severe respiratory disease with pulmonary hypertension and right ventricular failure summary box 17.3 examination general positive findings even if not related to the proposed procedure should be explored further surgery related type and site of surgery complications occurred due to underlying pathology systemic comorbidities and extent of limitation of each organ function specific for example suitability for positioning during surgery medical examination table 17.2 general anemia jaundice cyanosis nutritional status sources of infection teeth feet leg ulcers cardiovascular pulse bp heart sounds brew peripheral edema respiratory respiratory rate and effort chest expansion and percussion note breath sounds oxygen saturation gastrointestinal abdominal mass ascites bowel sounds hernia genitalia neurological conscious level cognitive function sensation muscle power tone and reflexes airway assessment examination specific to surgery at preoperative assessment the clinical findings site side specific imaging or investigation findings related to the pathology for which the surgery is proposed should be noted suitability of the patient for the proposed surgical option and vice versa should also be assessed for example laparoscopic procedures are less invasive and are therefore preferred in most however not all patients can tolerate pneumoperitoneum and positioning the type of surgery along with patient comorbidities determine perioperative risks for example perioperative mortality in major surgery such as that of open aortic aneurysm repair in the uk is 3% and that with endovascular repair is 1% sources of potential bacteremia can compromise surgical results especially if artificial material is implanted such as in joint replacement surgery or arterial grafting check for and treat infections in the preoperative period example infected toes pressure sores teeth and urine screen the patients for methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus colonization investigations the national institute of health and care excellence uk nice guidelines lay out the investigations needed for various categories of surgeries summary 17.4 investigations needed type of surgery major surgery can lead to organ system dysfunction needing most most investigations patient for example sickle cell test for patients of afro caribbean origin with family history of sickle cell disease comorbidities for example peak flow rates for severe asthmatics full blood count a full blood count is needed for major operations in the elderly and in those with anemia or pathology with ongoing blood loss and chronic disease in case of suspicion or history of sickle crisis a sickle cell test is needed in patients of afro caribbean and indian subcontinent origin urea and electrolytes urea and electrolytes are needed before all major operations in most patients over 65 years of age especially with cardiovascular renal and endocrine disease or if significant blood loss is anticipated it is also needed in those on medications that affect electrolyte levels example steroids diuretics digoxin and sets intravenous fluids or nutrition therapy and endocrine problems electrocardiography electrocardiography is required for those patients over 65 years of age and symptomatic patients with a history of rheumatic fever diabetes cardiovascular renal and cerebrovascular disease with and without severe respiratory problems it will also depend on if the surgery is minor or intermediate or major 
chest radiograph cost effectiveness and risks of radiation exposure mean that chest radiograph should be restricted to specific patients such as those with cardiac failure severe copd acute respiratory problems pulmonary cancer metastasis or effusions or those who are deemed to be at risk of active pulmonary tuberculosis clotting screen if a patient has a history of a history suggestive of a bleeding diastasis liver disease eclampsia cholestasis or has a family history of bleeding disorder or is on antithrombotic or anticoagulant agents then coagulation screening will be needed however the effects of antiplatelet agents low molecular weight heparins and newer agents affecting factor 10a cannot be measured by routine laboratory tests urine analysis dipstick testing of urine should be performed on all patients to detect urinary infection biliuria glycosuria and inappropriate osmolality beta hcg women of child bearing age should be asked sensitively about their pregnancy status if in doubt a laboratory test or a reliable pregnancy kit low cost can be used after obtaining consent from the patient to avoid danger of exposure to surgery and anesthesia of the fetus <coughs> blood glucose and hba1c poor control of diabetes can lead to perioperative infection and slow recovery in patients with diabetes mellitus and endocrine problems hba1c indicates how well diabetes has been controlled over a longer duration early mobilization oral intake and return to normal and return to routine medication should be goals in management of diabetes arterial blood gases a low cost tool that has that can give quick and vital information in acute and chronic severe respiratory conditions acid based disturbances and conditions where there is changes changing in milieu example immediately before kidney transplant liver function test these are indicated in patients with jaundice known or suspected hepatitis cirrhosis malignancy or in patients with poor nutritional status other investigations specialist radiological views and recent imaging are sometimes required if imaging is going to be needed during surgery then this needs to be planned in advance specific preoperative problems and management specific medical problems encountered during preoperative assessment should be corrected to the best possible level many patients with severe disease see later will need to be referred to specialists the referral letter should include all the details including history examination and investigation results cardiovascular disease preoperative cardiovascular complications are frequent patients who can climb a flight of stairs without getting a shot of breath or chest pain or needing to stop are likely to tolerate a wide range of surgeries with an acceptable risk of perioperative cardiovascular morbidity and mortality however in at preoperative assessment it is important to identify the patients who have a high perioperative risk of major car- adverse cardiovascular events including myocardial infarction and make appropriate arrangements to reduce this risk patients at high risk are those with ischemic heart disease congestive cardiac failure arrhythmia severe peripheral vascular disease cerebrovascular disease or significant renal impairment especially if they are undergoing major intra abdominal or intra thoracic surgery in patients with ischemic heart disease the cardiac and coronary reserve can be evaluated using a stress test stress ecg stress echocardiogram myocardial scintigraphy the tests have a high negative predictive value but a relatively low positive predictive value if the test is negative the patient is unlikely to have ischemic heart disease conversely if it is positive the chances of the patient actually having ischemic heart disease is not necessarily very high but there is a need for further investigation such as coronary angiography recently measurement of the fractional con- coronary flow reserve during coronary angiography using a pressure wire has made it possible to identify coronary lesions that have the largest impact on myocardial perfusion in patients with any suggestion of valvular heart disease or poor left ventricular function an echocardiogram should be obtained pressure gradients across the valves dimension of the chambers and contractility can be determined using echocardiography an ejection fraction of less than 30% is associated with poor patient outcomes cardiopulmonary exercise testing provides a non invasive assessment of combined pulmonary cardiac and circulatory function the patient should be referred to a cardiologist if the murmur is heard and the patient is symptomatic the patient is known to have poor left ventricular function or cardiomegaly ischemic changes can be seen on ecg even if the patient is not symptomatic silent ischemia silent mi is frequent there is an abnormal rhythm on the ecg for example tachycardia or bradycardia or heart block summary box 17.5 preoperative management of patient with systemic disease 
capacity baseline organ function capacity should be assessed optimization medication lifestyle changes specialist refer will, referral will improve organ capacity alternative minimally impacting procedure appropriate post operative care will improve outcomes theater preparations timing team work special instruments and equipments hypertension ischemic heart disease and coronary stents prior to elective surgery blood pressure should be controlled to near 160 by 100 mmhg if a new antihypertensive agent is introduced in stabilization period of at least 2 weeks should be allowed patients with angina that is not well controlled should be investigated for the by a cardiologist the indications for coronary revascularization in these patients before major surgery are the same as the medical indications pharmacological protection is indicated patients on beta blocker and on statins should be maintained on their medication initiating statin pre operatively should be considered most long term cardiac medications should be continued over the peri operative period angiotensin converting enzymes inhibitor ace inhibitor and receptor blockers are often omitted 24 hours prior to surgery and reintroduced gradually in the post operative period after a proven myocardial infarction Elective surgery should be postponed for 3 to 6 months to reduce the risk of perioperative reinfarction as primary percutaneous intervention is the treatment of choice for acute coronary syndromes many patients receive stents and are on dual antiplatelet therapy for 12 months if surgery is absolutely necessary within the period of dual antiplatelet therapy the management strategy should be decided jointly by surgeon cardiologist anesthetist and patient as it is essential to consider the balance of risk of continuing antiplatelet agents with the risk of increased bleeding and stopping them with the risk of stent thrombosis the risk of stent thrombosis with consequences of mi and death is reduced if elective surgery is delayed until after dual antiplatelet therapy is no longer needed about 6 weeks later bare metal and 12 months after drug eluting stent insertion although with the newest drug eluting stent 6 months dual antiplatelet therapy may be enough this is the ecg of preoperative electrocardiogram of a patient who exp- who complained of chest pain the previous day showing transient transpural anterior myocardial infarction with q waves and st elevation so it's anterior so we can see on the chest lids v1 v2 and v3 anterior chest wall lids q wave and st elevation If surgery cannot be postponed and the risk of significant perioperative bleeding is low, dual antiplatelet therapy can be continued during surgery. If the benefits of surgery can be neglected, negated by bleeding in closed cavities, spinal, intracranial, cardiac, post chamber, posterior chamber of the eye, and prostate surgery, clopidogrel and ticagrelor lord therapy may have to be stopped and, if possible, aspirin continued. However, a cardiology opinion should be sought. Dysrhythmias. in patients with atrial fibrillation beta blockers digoxin or calcium channel blockers should be started preoperatively or continued if the patient is already on such medication in order to control rate and possible rhythm cardiac output can increase by 15% if sinus rhythm is restored warfarin in patients with atrial fibrillation should be stopped 5 days preoperatively to achieve an international normalized ratio of 1.5 or less which is safe for most surgery the newer anticoagulants such as dabigatran direct thrombin inhibitor or rivaroxaban apixaban and idoxaban direct factor 10a inhibitors do not have antagonists and must be stopped preoperatively generally for 2 to 3 days in patients with normal renal function and longer when renal function is impaired alternative anticoagulation is not required in the perioperative period unless the risk of stroke is high high chat to chats to wax core bridging therapy with unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin is recommended for patients with atrial fibrillation and a mechanical heart valve undergoing procedures that require interruption of warfarin decisions on bridge bridging therapy should balance the risks of stroke and bleeding implanted pacemakers and cardiac defibrillators checks and appropriate re- reprogramming should be done preoperatively by specialists monopolar diathermy activity during surgery may be sensed by the pacemakers as ventricular fibrillation before cardioversion and over pace modes must be turned off and switched on after surgery to convert or converted to ventricle paced not sensed with no response to sensing voo mode bipolar diathermy should be made available at surgery symptomatic heart blocks and asymptomatic second morbid stroke and third degree heart blocks if discovered at preoperative assessment clinic will need cardiology consultation and temporary or permanent pacemaker insertion 
figures 17.2 and 13 illustrate ECGs from two cases requiring preoperative optimization. We will see the ECG first. Figure 17.2 Routine preoperative cardio electrocardiogram in an 83 year old patient with no symptoms other than lethargy for the past three months. This shows complete heart block with associated P waves and QRS complexes requiring preoperative pacing. You can see on the lead tone there is no regularity between P waves and the QRS complexes. Irregularly irregular. Atrial flutter. Value of heart disease while anesthetic management is altered to achieve hemodynamic stability in moderate valvular diseases. The patients with severe aortic and mitral stenosis may benefit from valvuloplasty before elective canal cardiac surgery. Appropriate referral to anesthetist and cardiologist should be made. In patients with mechanical heart valves, warfarin needs to be stopped for 5 days before surgery and an infusion of unfractionated heparin started when the INR falls below 1.5. The activated partial thromboplastin type should be monitored to keep it at 1.5 times normal and the infusion is then stopped 2 hours before surgery. Heparin and warfarin should be started in the post-operative period and heparin is stopped when the full effect of warfarin takes effect. Thrombin inhibitors and factors 10A inhibitors are not licensed and should not be used in patients with mechanical valves. Anemia and blood transfusion. Patients found to be anemic at pre-operative assessment should be investigated for the cause of their anemia. They should be treated with iron and vitamin supplements. Chronic anemia is well tolerated in the perioperative period. However, if the patient is undergoing a major procedure, preoperative transfusion may be considered. If excessive bleeding is expected, then a preoperative group and save should be performed and an appropriate number of units of blood cross matched. Some patients may refuse blood transfusion, for example, a Jehovah's Witness. It in such a case, during the consent process, see later, discussion should include which blood products and or device system, example cell salvage, reinfusion from drains is acceptable. The discussion should extend to other areas, for example, whether refusal of transfusion would apply in life-threatening situations. As in all consent processes, the discussion and outcome should be clearly documented.